In this lecture, we're going to review how to actually measure energy in systems. And it's very important to understand that we don't actually measure uh, energy in total of what is in bonds and potential. What we measure is the change of thermal or heat energy or motion energy. So we're going to measure uh, and learn to measure the change in heat energy in an object. So an object, and that object could be anything, it could be a block of lead, a block of iron, it doesn't really matter. But we're going to take the temperature before, we call it temperature initial, and then we'll take the temperature uh, at the final position after it has gained or lost thermal or heat energy, which we now know is motion energy. So to measure energy, we need to understand the different types of energies and go back a little bit before we get lost into the details. First of all, energy is essentially the ability to do work. Okay? And it's work. And we learn that work is equal to a force times a distance. Okay? And that comes out to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that fancy unit is what a joule is equal to. And we learn that a joule is a measure of thermal energy. Okay? Any case, it's an amount. Now, kinetic energy, if we haven't already figured out, is the Please energy. The kinetic, kinetic energy is, if we haven't already remembered, is the energy of motion. Oh, kinetic means motion. So it's the energy of motion. If molecules move faster, they have more kinetic energy. Temperature is underneath kinetic energy because this is the average kinetic energy. And the reason why we need an average is the molecules have a what? A range of motions. Okay? I have alluded to these range of motions by looking at the kinetic energy or speed. These are the number of particles. And we know that at a certain temperature molecules can go faster than the average and below the average. But this shows you that on average most of the molecules have about or, or at similar speeds. Some are way above and some way below. That's what these Boltzmann distribution graphs show us. But to illustrate this a little better, let's get through some of these slides, which I'm playing, by the way, on that presentation, Google Slides on your website. Let's play this animation. At any given temperature, the molecules of a gas are in continual motion. At any instant, some molecules have more kinetic energy of motion than others. With increasing temperature, the average kinetic energy increases in proportion to the absolute temperature. This graph shows the distribution of molecular speeds for a particular gas at two different temperatures. Notice that the most probable molecular speed, given by the peak of the curve, increases as the temperature increases. Here we see a mixture of two gases with different molecular masses, helium and neon. The more massive neon atoms move more slowly, but they possess the same average kinetic energy as the helium atoms. At a given temperature, the distribution of molecular speeds for helium is much more spread toward high speeds than for neon. Okay, so the, the idea that I want you to get from this is that essentially molecules move at all different speeds, and that's why you can graph these distribution of speeds with a Boltzmann graph. Okay, so temperature is just an average all right so if we're trying to measure energy and that's the whole purpose of this lecture the temperature only gives me an insight it just gives me the average motion which is important information because if this block was to absorb energy wouldn't the motion in the object wouldn't the molecules vibrate and move a little faster and the answer of course is yes so if I know that the average is increasing in the motion, I know the energy is increasing. And if I know the average before and the average after, that can give me some insight of what energy was absorbed. Now before we get to that, we have to understand there's another form of energy called potential energy. Now potential energy forever has been called stored energy. This is the energy that's not in motion. For instance, the, the, the type of energy that we deal that's, quote, stored um, is chemical energy. For instance, you saw a propane torch in class where I was melting um, potassium chlorate or I was heating up water from a torch. The whole point is 
that energy that came from the butane was from the chemical reactions. Butane and O2 reacted to make CO2 in water. And energy was given off. That's why it's an exothermic reaction. Where did that energy come from? Well, it came from the bonds. We broke bonds and we reformed new ones. And the difference in where you start and where you finish gives me that delta H that's negative. The negative chain we dropped. This energy released so that you have more stable products is due to the differences in the stability of the bonds before and after. We'll talk more about that. But so chemical energy is a form of stored. And we'll talk more. Now, if you remember your potential energy, if a rock on top of the hill and up and it has the potential to fall, so it has high potential energy. And when you push it, the rock starts moving. This is the rock moving. So its kinetic energy increases, all right, as it starts moving. So you've heard about these things before. Think about gasoline or things that can explode and burn have a high potential. That's why they do give off energy, all right? But we're not going to measure potential energy here with our measuring energy because we are measuring using temperature to get a feeling about the total kinetic energy changes that result from heat going into a system or going out of a system. So understand, because we're going to use temperature, which is an average, we're going to be measuring the changes of the motion energy. We're not going to measure potential. A thermometer cannot measure the potential. All right, it's very important. So let's continue. Now, to measure energy, and we want the total energy, it's important you understand. So we're measuring total heat here, or thermal energy, going in or going out. It's important you understand we're measuring the change. So we have to know our final initial conditions, and temperature helps us. Now, as we talked, temperature is an average. Now, let me speak to this a second. Let's say I have two averages in a class. Let's say I have an average of 80, and I have an average of 90. These could be students in a class. This class is performing better, so it has a higher average. Now, if I, was to, if I wanted to figure out how many points, if I added up all the, the grades, or the GPAs, the grade point averages of the class, and I wanted what? Total points. I would have to take every single individual student, and let's say Johnny has a 70, Jackie's got an 80, um, you know, Sam's got a 94. I'd have to take all their grades and add them together to get the total points. Well, I have to know something about each individual what? Student. Well, I don't have that with temperature. Temperature only gives me an average and only an insight. So I need to take temperature, or better yet, change of temperature, because I'm going to take a final and initial state. And I have to times it by something to get total heat or total points. Now back to the students. If I, was, if I knew that the average was 80 in a class, that's the, ch okay, and let's say, it went up to a 90. It went up 10 points because what? The class absorbed some more learning, okay? Or they had a better teacher or what have you, okay? So if the change in the learning was 10, average change to 10, in this case it could be temperature, to get the total points that were increased, wouldn't I have to times that average by the number of students? Think with me for a second. I want the total number of points. Now, I don't have the individual scores, but I do have what? The average. And if you think with me, if you take the average, in this case, um, 10 is the change of the average, and I times it by, let's say there's 10 students in the class, can you say that overall 100 points have gone up? Remember, 10 students and then you have a change in the average of 10. Wouldn't you say 100 points increased? I don't care if one student, okay, had 99 and one student had the one, okay, and the other one stayed the same. All I know is the points increased 100, uh, 100 points. I have to know how many students. Well, same thing here. If I know the change in speed for temperature, instead of students, I need to know the number of what? 
particles, molecules, substances. Now we're not going to count particles, but what we're going to use is we're going to use mass. Mass gives me an indication because mass does not change with pressure, okay, or differences. Mass is pretty constant, and mass will give me essentially how many particles. So to get the total number of points of energy that went into this classroom, or in this case the block, I need the mass times a change in temperature. All right, that'll give me some insight. Now here's the problem. This would be great, and we'd be done here. But we'll have to assume something. We have to assume that this substance that we're testing, and it could have been this iron block above, okay, this object, we're assuming its ability to change its temperature is the same as other compounds. That's not the case. Back to our classroom um, analogy. Some classes might have students, because they study and work harder than other students, can increase their number easily. So with the same amount of teaching, extra teaching, some classes might go up higher than others just by, based upon the type of student you have. Or in the case of chemistry, some temperature changes can occur at a greater or less amount based on the substances. You know that there's some things that are good conductors of, of heat. right? What's a good conductor of heat? You would say metals are. You know when you heat a metal, it gets hot fast. When you heat a piece of wood, it does not. So the ability, this is important, to change your temperature or change your what? Change your classroom average is based upon how well they can change. In the case of the student, it's how, uh, how diligent the students are. In the case of chemicals, it's their ability to move. Some chemicals, okay, are tightly bound, and we'll talk about this, because they're rigid and tightly bound to one another, they don't move very well, so therefore they don't conduct heat. I want you to think about molecules doing this. Here's one molecule, here's some other molecules in a system. For these two to start moving more, they have to be hit by these two. Now, if somehow they are being attracted to other particles that keep them in that fixed position, they're not going to move much, so therefore things hit them, but they don't move very much, and therefore that chain reaction of these guys hitting the other ones don't occur. And we would say these are poor conductors or insulators. So we have to have some kind of factor in here that tells me how well things conduct. So let's go look at our formula so far. So we have mass times some kind of Thing that measures how well you can change its temperature. We call that specific heat, and it's C. Now let's build this formula. We have Q, and let's get this stuff out of the way. Q is going to be heat. It's going to be in joules. So we have Q, which is a heat, equals mass times specific heat. That is how well something can change its what? Its temperature. Okay? times the temperature change. Now let me speak to this thing called specific heat. Let's think about a metal. A metal has a great ability to change its temperature. Only with a little bit of heat its, temp its temperature will change because it conducts heat so well. So metals tend to have low specific heats. Things like water, okay, as you know, we're surrounded by water, and it takes forever the cold water in our, or in our uh, oceans to get warmer. Right now, in October, the water temperature is probably warmer than the air temperature because it takes forever to, for water to lose its heat. So water has a high specific heat. It needs a lot of heat in order for it to change its temperature because it tracks each other pretty strongly. Water is a pretty good conductor. That's why we use it to radiate heat in our homes. All right. So we would say that water would have a high specific heat, and the value of water is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. This says something. It takes 4.18 joules to take a gram of water and increase it or change it one degree Celsius. That's what it is. Now. Metals like iron, I believe iron is 0.11 joules 
per gram per degree Celsius. What does this mean? It, to change a gram of iron, one gram of it, because you have to know how much mass you're dealing with, one degree Celsius, it only takes 0 0.11 joules. It takes a lot less. Well, why? Well, because metals conduct energy well. Now, this value for specific heat is given to you in table, I believe, B of your reference table. Let's go there. Okay, here we are. Let's go to our reference tables and look at reference tables B. And if you see, we have the specific heat capacity for water. This shows how well water can change its temperature, meaning it takes, and let's zoom, zoom in here up close and personal, it takes 4.18 joules to change one gram of it, one Kelvin. You may say, well, Kelvins, Kelvins, I could convert here. No, no, this is a change in temperature. And we learned last night that a Kelvin okay is the same size as a celsius degree so a change in kelvin is the same thing as a change in celsius so this can be used interconvertibly all right and the metals would be lower it takes a lot of energy to move water it's a good thing it takes forever to heat the water but it takes forever for water to lose its heat that's why we use it in our homes okay now let's go back we will be dealing primarily with water so we're pretty much always using this value so this is our formula that we use to measure the total heat that left or entered a substance. And we don't have to memorize this because it's given to us in table T. Let's go there. Remember, table T is your last uh, important uh, formulas and equation table, and it's on the back page. And you can see we have the density. We have percent error there. But if you look carefully, we have how to convert temperature. Kelvin equals Celsius degree plus 273. And look at here, we have heat. And look at the equation we have here that they give you. All of this is given to you if you're viewing displeasure. And there it is. And it's viewing beautiful, okay, uh, right there. So Q, which is they tell you is the heat. That's the joules. There's the mass. There's the specific heat, which is given to you in reference table B. And the change in temperature, that's final minus initial, goes right there. So that's given to you. But now you know why. To measure the total energy going into and out, that's the thermal energy, not the potential. How many students, how well they can change their grade, and how their what? Average changed gives me total points changed. Okay? And again, if we weren't using water, we'd have to have the value given to us for this. All right? So let's go to our worksheet, and I'm going to model a couple of problems and then hopefully you can continue on. All right, taking out our worksheet that I gave you in class today, or downloaded, let's do a couple of these together. So we start with number one, let's be crazy and go in order. How many joules of heat are required to heat a three gram sample of water from four degrees Celsius to nine degrees? Okay, so I start with my formula. Q is equal to mass, specific heat, change in temperature. Let's put the units in. We have a three gram sample of water. So three grams, okay, specific heat is 4.18 joules over gram. We're gonna use degrees Celsius, even though they give us Kelvin, Celsius change, change in a, and a Kelvin change are the same, okay? And if you're not sure about that, if you look at 100 degrees Celsius and zero degrees Celsius, here's the two fixed points in our thermometers that are made. You notice the difference between these two is 100. In Kelvins, what are they? They're 373 and 273. So the freezing point of water is 273 in Kelvins, but zero in Celsius. The boiling point of water is 373 in Kelvins and 100 in Celsius. So the difference of these two numbers are still 100. So if you're subtracting Kelvins or Celsius, okay, we're doing the difference of the change of heat it'll be the same value, okay? That's why that works. The temperature change, well, we're going from four, four degrees Celsius to nine. So nine is the final, minus four, and you get five. So there's a change of five degrees. Notice the units that cancel. Grams over grams cancel, and Celsius over Celsius, and you're left with joules, and that's how this works. It's a good habit to do that. Put this in your calculator, and it goes three, times 4.18, okay, times 5, and you get 62.7 joules. Careful. If you're looking at this as a test question, 
this has one sig fig, these guys have one sig fig, so my answer should have one sig fig, so I would round this, believe it or not, to 60, no point, 60 joules. And that would be my answer. Okay. So the next one, number two, oops, let's go, let's go continue here. The next one, what do you do here? A 1.5 liter sample oil changes from 10 to 60. There's my temperature change. We're just measuring the energy change in a substance. In this case, it's always going to be water. How many calories of heat were required? Okay, now I'm asking calories here. Okay, how many kilocalories? How many joules? All right, well, I'm going to do this this way. I'm going to start with joules first. I know it's Q is equal to M C change in T. Now, the problem here is that I have 1.5 liters of water. How many grams is that? Well, we should know that 1.5 liters of water is really 1,500 milliliters of water, right? Change that to milliliters. It's getting, it's going to get what? Bigger by three decimal places because milliliters is smaller. Unit. So what's going to happen? My friends in chemistry, well, it's 1,500 milliliters and we know the density of water is one gram for every one milliliter. Well, if there's 1,500 milliliters, this becomes 1,500 grams. Specific heat, 4.18 joules over gram per degree Celsius. This is given to me in table B. Notice for this to work out, this has to be grams. So if you put liters, it wouldn't cancel. That's why using the units is important. Change in temperature. 60 minus 10, and that gives me a 50 degrees is my change. And we can cancel our units. The grams cancel, degrees Celsius, and I'm left with joules. And let's find the answer. 1,500 times 4.18 times 50. All right, that gives me an answer, and I can't fit it over here, of 313. 313,500 zero, zero, three hundred, three hundred joules. They're asking for kilojoules. Okay, so to go to kilojoules, you should know I'm going to get rid of joules. Kilojoules are bigger, they get the smaller number. So I'm dividing by a thousand. Okay, and I get 313.5, and that'd be kilojoules. Now, calories. How do a calorie and a joule different? Well, as we talked about previously, I'm going to just use this information here. I know that 4.18 joules equals one calorie. How do I know that? Well, calorie by definition was made equal to one. They figured out the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, is actually one calorie. They made it that way. And they said, okay, we'll measure the joules and figure that out. So this is the converting factor. 4.18 joules equals one calorie. All right. Right now, all I care about is you getting joules and kilojoules. Don't worry about kilocalories or calories. Okay? So, what I would like you to do, okay, forget about the calories, just answer everything in joules. Okay? For number three, try using the information given to me. Try number three. Notice they give you a, a kilogram of water. And I want number four done. Okay? So try three and four, and we'll also try five. Five will be a little more challenging, but I think you can do it. So try five, and do three and four, okay? Three, four, and five is your homework. The key is posted. Hopefully this helps.